Hello and welcome to a short video from Posted in the Past. This is a project that I began many years ago where I researched postcards that were sent more than 100 years ago. And using genealogy, I researched the people who received the postcards and also, uh, when I can, who sent them. And to do this, I use genealogy. So I use the resources that are available to anyone who is doing their family history. Now, when I choose a postcard uh, to research, uh, the only thing I do before I buy it, if I'm buying it online, is check to see if I can find the recipient in either the 1901 or the 1911 census. Those two returns give me the starting point. And from that information, I'm then able to create the family tree for the uh, recipient. Now, very often, if the card has been sent by a family member, it might not actually be obvious who that person is until I have worked on the family tree. And that's the case with this postcard, which was sent from London to an address in Dorchester, in Dorset. Now, this family tree was, was quite a, a problem to begin with. And um, I, I actually started it a couple of times before I was happy that I had the details correct. One of the problems I encountered was that I ended up with too many children in, in the family. And because the 1911 census includes the number of children born to a, a wife, if she is still married and not a widow or divorced, etc., um, that, that told me how many children I, I, I really was looking for because it will say how many children the, the mother has had and how many have died. So, so it's a very useful way of confirming that you have your facts correct. And I had too many children. And um, I, I almost was just going to put it to one side and, and not do any more research on this card. But anyway, I persevered and I, I discovered that the problem had been caused because two brothers lived next door to each other in Dorchester and they were married and they had children and on the night that the census return was taken one of the brothers was away from home and when the information was transcribed the two families were put together as one large family. Now this actually makes no sense because you have um, the husband and his wife and their children, which are correct. But then you have this other group of children, which includes the, the man's sister-in-law, who was obviously far too old to be his child. And so once I unraveled that, then, then, then that was fine. But the worrying thing is that this information appeared in several family trees online that I looked at, just trying to, to see what, what was happening with the family and they hadn't resolved this problem. Now, another problem that I had with this family was that there were two children, two daughters with the same name. And obviously uh, that's unlikely. And I discovered on the other trees I looked at that they had combined this into one person and hadn't actually bothered to try and find out why there was a there was a potential problem <clears throat> and I discovered that actually one daughter died as an infant and then a few years later the couple had another daughter and they called her by the name of this this deceased daughter so there were two individual people uh, two children with the same name but when you look at the um, birth records and then look at burial records it revealed and confirmed what had happened so from the aspect of doing uh, family history research, um, you can't take things on face value and you mustn't. You must check all this information. So once I had resolved the problems with the family, I discovered that the card was actually sent um, by a cousin, Edith. Now, the majority of the, the family in this card story remained in Dorset. Uh, they perhaps moved out of Dorchester to Weymouth 
or Bournemouth, um, although at this time Bournemouth would have actually been in Hampshire, but 30 miles away from Dorchester, they didn't actually go too far. But Edith, who sent this card, uh, she did move away and I found her in Braunton in North Devon working as a maid. Now I know this, this area, uh, my grandparents retired to Braunton uh, from the Midlands in the in the 60s and so I visited them and then la in later years I, I've gone just to have a wander around and to, to remember things and uh, Edith worked as a maid in a large house and, and this house is down a long private drive so I've never actually seen where she worked but in the museum in Braunton there are photographs of it and one of the photographs that they have is uh, of a garden party and the photograph was taken at the time Edith would have been there. And in the background, behind the guests in their lovely uniforms, are the maids who would have helped serve the refreshments. And, and it could well be that Edith was one of those. She later uh, moved to London, and it's from London that the postcard was, was sent. And she then... Uh, went across the Atlantic to Canada and she appears in Canadian records working as, as a maid. Now in 1914, I don't know if she was returning permanently or whether she was just coming back for a visit, but she appears in the passenger list for the Empress of Ireland. Now this was part of the Canadian Pacific Line and the ships would sail from Quebec to, to Liverpool, carrying passengers and post. So she was planning on returning on, on this ship. Now, during the early hours of the first night, um, the ship was still sailing down the St. Lawrence River, which is a long waterway. And during the early hours, um, it encountered atrocious conditions, thick fog. And of course, it, they didn't have the GPS systems that we have today. And it lost its position and it actually collided with another ship. Within 15 minutes, the ship sank and there was a, a great, great loss of life, including Edith. There are actually more passengers lost on this ship than on Titanic, although obviously Titanic's overall loss was, was much, much greater. Now, one of the reasons why so many passengers were lost on this ship was because it was the first night um, these passengers would have had to do a lot of travelling to get to the, the port. So they were tired, they were exhausted. And also they would have been unfamiliar with the ship. But they only had 50 minutes and that was from impact to when it, it sank. So it's not surprising when you discover how many of the passengers were lost. Also on board as part of the passengers were more than 130 members of the Salvation Army and they were all lost. Now, when I was researching this, this card, which is featured in my first book, the Salvation Army in Canada were incredibly helpful. They were able to provide some photographs which were taken from the dockside and they showed members of the Salvation Army in their uniforms waving to the crowds below. And they also showed the band playing and the band played out on deck as the ship sailed away. They were the, the members of the Salvation Army that were returning to England were actually going to the Royal Albert Hall for a conference. And um, at this time, um, the turn of the century and the early years of the 20th century, uh, the Salvation Army were, were, were actively um, opening up branches in, in Canada. And that's why there were so many of them. Two of the members of the Salvation Army that, that lost their lives actually came from Bournemouth and I was able to research uh, their, their story. Uh, there were other people from Wimborne in Dorset as, as well. So it's a very, very sad, sad story. And um, I must admit, I'd never heard of the Empress of Ireland, but, but once I was aware of it through the, the records of, of Edith's death, uh, I looked out for more information and I was surprised actually how little there is. In Canada, the tragedy is, is still remembered on its anniversary, particularly with the Salvation Army. But in this country, there's very, very little about it. And when I contacted the Maritime Museum in Liverpool, 
the archivist I spoke to had had known about the the disaster, uh, but confirmed that there is actually no memorial to it in this country. Now a lot of the um, crew uh, were from Liverpool, so it's surprising actually that, that there isn't anything to to commemorate the disaster in in Liverpool. On board the ship, as well as carrying passengers, there was silver, silver bullion, and also post. It was carrying post. And there was a salvage um, attempt, a successful attempt, where the silver was recovered. And they also brought up some of the, the post that was on the ship. And some of that post has found its way to the Postal Museum in Bath. And I was able to arrange to go and have a look at it. At it, it's not always on on display, so you do need to make an appointment. And I was amazed at the condition of the, the these envelopes and the contents, presumably. The they were hardly damaged at all, and you could still read the address on on the envelopes. And presumably, they were retrieved and perhaps forwarded on. I, I don't know. Interestingly, um, the archivist at, the, at this museum had never looked inside the, the contents of the envelopes because um, he was a philatelist, so he was interested in the stamps and the story of the ship, whereas I was looking at them from the point of view as a, a family historian, and I was itching to see what was inside, but I wasn't allowed to handle them, which was a shame, but I think there would have been a story to tell. When I visited the Postal Museum in London, um, which is a relatively new uh, venture, I was hoping to find more information out about the, the ship, uh, but they had nothing either. And, and it does seem that this disaster has almost been forgotten. Um, one of the reasons for this is that shortly afterwards, there was the outbreak of the First World War. So that, that obviously overshadowed this also, it would always come second to Titanic's numbers. You know, the number of poor people who lost their lives um, was always going to come second in um, the the records. But it seems such such a shame that it has been forgotten. Because when I, I've I've looked at books that I, I've I've managed to source that that tell stories about similar disasters, the Empress. Empress only gets a sentence, if, if that. And it seems such a remarkable story. There's a lot more to the story. There's a lot more that I researched. And I do actually offer this as a talk to groups, um, either by Zoom or in person. And it, it's a, a subject which actually takes up a whole talk, whereas some talks I give about postcards, I, I will mention two or three. But there is so much more about this uh, disaster that it actually has turned into a into a longer longer talk. So if um, if you perhaps you're a member of a group and and you're up, you're interested in in hearing a talk about that about the Empress of Ireland or any of my other stories, um, you can contact me, um, leave a comment or uh, my email address is actually on YouTube. I'm also on Twitter and Facebook, and uh, you can find me as posted in the past. And every day I share a postcard and it's either going to be um, one that I've already researched and which has already been included in one of my published books, or it will be one from a future project. Um, I, I always have postcards I'm researching on the go and um, I already have the postcards that will be included in my next book and going forward, other projects are all, already taking shape. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this this story um, it's rather a sad one poor Edith um, sort of paid the the ultimate price for for spreading her wings I think and um, it's um, I think a bonus of actually doing what I do is that I can tell people uh, about this disaster because I've yet to actually speak to anyone at a talk that has heard of it so I think actually um, the whole idea behind what I do is to remember the people that sent and received the cards. And so this one in particular, I think it's important that um, it has been researched and recorded. Anyway, thank you for listening and uh, hopefully you'll, you'll find the time to watch another of my videos in the future.